do 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 Thousands of years ago, when your mum was born, Egyptian. <laughs> That's it. That's the tone. That's the tone set. <clears throat> Egyptian kings played a game of great and terrible power. These shadow games erupted into a war that threatened to destroy the entire world, until a brave and powerful pharaoh locked the magic away, imprisoning it within the mystical Millennium Items, never to be seen again. At least until a flamboyant asshole with a trust fund decides to go on holiday. If you grew up in the early 2000s, you were part of one of three cliques. You were either a Pokemon fan, a Digimon fan, or a Yu-Gi-Oh fan. Or you were like me and liked all three at least once. Or you were even part of that niche fourth clique that didn't watch any of them at all. They were card captors fans. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I like card captors. <laughs> While I eventually gave up on all those other shows for different reasons, Yu-Gi-Oh kind of remained in my pop culture zeitgeist through one means or another, right up until I rejoined the card game and anime proper in 2017. And I think you just need to look to the shelf to my right to see if it's stuck or not. I mean, you can't because it's just off camera here. But I've got this. This nice little presentation? I guess? Do people actually pay attention to what I put back here? Because I spend like a good minute or two setting this up. Do you guys care? I can't even explain why I like this franchise so much. Maybe it's the myriad of awesome monsters and colourful characters. Maybe it's the outlandish but awesome storylines and honestly interesting world building. Maybe it's down to the frankly questionable, but admittedly charming English dub. Legitimately, while the censoring and localization of Yu-Gi-Oh could make for an interesting topic all on its own, I do unironically love the English dub. And I can already feel people leaving hateful comments saying how I don't know anything and all that other stuff, whatever. Look, it's my, it's my opinion, okay? I like it. I've wanted to cover Yu-Gi-Oh for a while now, outside of the live-action Duel series, but didn't quite know where to start. Or at least where to start that wouldn't lead to another multi-part series that consumes most of my life. Far too early for that. Not to mention, this is the first big project I'll be working on with my new laptop and software so I don't necessarily want to mess up a video that a lot of people are excited for. I need to see just what I can do with this and how well it can handle the kind of projects I want to make in the future. So what I'm looking for, if anything, is something short, simple, and featuring some of that sweet, sweet card game nostalgia. Well, I can think of nothing better than the 10th anniversary special, Yu-Gi-Oh! Bonds Beyond Time. Is it ironic that I'm doing this during my own 10th anniversary? Maybe. Maybe. I actually watched this when it first came out. Totally illegally. And it was one of the two things I mentioned that kept me mildly interested in the franchise. Three guesses as to which a bridge series I'm talking about. Look, if you've seen any of my other stuff, you'll know I'm a fan of a bridge series, and I think it's safe to say that it's thanks to Little Karibo that I continued having a passing interest in the series through the 2010s. However, I am going to try and not reference his material in this review that much. Don't get me wrong, I love the guy and his work, but I should try and make this review stand on its own two feet without having to rely on his material. I'll give myself, like, one reference or something, but that's it. Before we begin, for the benefit of anyone new watching, which... Bloody hell, you picked a, you picked a weird place to start. 
Here's a very quick summary of the three different eras that cross over in this special. The original series, affectionately referred to as Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters, follows the story of young yugi Moto as he unlocks the secrets of the Millennium Puzzle, awakening an ancient Egyptian spirit, who just so happens to be really, really good at playing modern-day children's trading card games. After his grandpa's soul is stolen by Maximilian Pegasus, Yugi and his pals travel to Duelist Kingdom to win it back, which he eventually does, being crowned the King of Games. One thing I will say, I like that this isn't just some over-bloated title. We see, in one of my personal favourite episodes, that Yugi can pick up and play pretty much any game he needs to, even beating its creator in the aforementioned episode. The original manga even showcased more than just the card game initially, before it became popular, and I don't know about anyone else, but I wouldn't have minded seeing more games introduced throughout the series. Or, if you're really so dead set on just having the card game, then maybe some more variations of play, sort of like the Labyrinth Duel in the first series, which they eventually did make some rules for. God, I've only just explained the first series and already we're off on a tangent. After that, he entered the frankly legendary Battle City Tournament, orchestrated by his rival, Seto Kaiba, in a ploy to gather the three Egyptian god cards. It's literally the second season, and we're already introducing the divine Egyptian gods. It was always a weird decision, in my opinion. Even as a kid, it always felt weird. However, Yugi was also challenged by Marek Ishtar and his rare hunters, who wanted to seek vengeance against the pharaoh and rule the world. Honestly, this is probably my favourite collection of duels in the whole series, particularly Yugi's duel against Arcana, who runs a dark magician deck much like Yugi's. After a filler arc that honestly made me lose interest in the show, Yugi eventually wins the Battle City Tournament and obtains all three Egyptian god cards. After some stuff to do with Atlantis or something, Yugi and the Pharaoh face off against their sometimes kind of friend Bakora and eventually learn the Pharaoh's real name, allowing him to return to the afterlife. It's sad, it's beautiful, we get one more duel between the two of them. It's great. Everyone loves it. After that, it was decided to continue the story with a new cast in a new location, hence the creation of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. A show that I saw the first two minutes of when it first aired, before immediately switching to another channel once I realised it wasn't about Yugi anymore. Yeah, I was one of those kids. In recent years, I've obviously corrected this and actually watched GX. And while it's definitely not my favourite, I do still like it, I guess? Question mark? Our new lead, Jaden Yuki, joins the illustrious Duel Academy with the dream of becoming the next King of Games. Along with his friends, he faces a cavalcade of enemies, some who have an actual presence in the story from the start, and some that just turned up out of nowhere and were meant to suddenly care about them. If I'm completely honest, I'm not a fan of GX's overarching stories. There's just something about them that never quite grabbed me, even on my rewatch. That being said, I absolutely adore the one-off episodes and self-contained stories. They're arguably the best in the entirety of Yu-Gi-Oh! Damon, the Dual Giant, Dimitri... A lot of people with Ds. Because we all know if you're a woman in the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe, you're gonna get the short end of the dueling stick. Jaden even faces off against the Paradox Brothers. And the Dark Magician Girl and a dueling monkey called Wheeler. It's great! I bloody love it! For some reason, Season 4 didn't get dubbed, so the last time the English audience saw Jaden is when he fuses with a monster spirit called Yubel and is taken away to face some big evil thing or something. Although I will say, because I know people will comment about it otherwise, Jaden does eventually return, faces off against some darkness or something, graduates, and starts travelling the world. I haven't seen Season 4 fully yet, but I do intend to do so at some point, and have enjoyed what I've seen so far. After GX, we head into the final series that we're talking about today, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. Set about 50 years from now, whenever now 
is. <laughs> Yusei Fudo learns that he is one of five signers, that series spiritual MacGuffin thing, and must save New Domino City from the Dark Signers as they try to bring about some big, terrible, spoopy thing. Okay, that's not the best explanation, but trust me when I say 5Ds is some top-tier Yu-Gi-Oh. I love the characters. I love the futuristic setting. I love a lot of the decks used here. And you can't talk about 5Ds without, of course, mentioning... The Duel Runners. Yeah, 5Ds introduced a gimmick where, instead of simply standing facing your opponent, you could now challenge them in what's referred to as a Turbo Duel where you'd both play, say it with me now, card games on motorcycles. Oh god, I wasted my reference. Five Ds would continue into a second series, where the gang enter a turbo dueling Grand Prix, as well as facing off against a shadowy cabal known as Iliasta. Though, once again, the dub doesn't complete the whole series, leaving the show on a rather pathetically rushed conclusion, literally ending with Yusei saying, And now history and the future are safe forever. That's not edited. That's literally how it ends. We've saved the day. No need to wrap up here. Oh no, just just cut to black. That big floating city above New Domino. Oh, we definitely stopped that. Mhm. Mm yes, sir. Don't even don't don't even ask me how. Just give me just give me that bottle that that bottle of lemonade conditional clause cuz you know, it's not like we're 18 at this point or something. Bloody hell. We will come back to this, but I'm already four pages into this script and about into this video, and we haven't even started the review yet. So I guess we'll do that then. Our story begins in the ever beautiful city of Venice. Jaden is being chased by physical manifestations of Cyber N Dragon and Rainbow Dragon, respectively. Which I can't help but immediately question, since, as far as I'm aware, solid vision technology, where dual monsters have actual mass and can cause physical damage, doesn't come into existence until the events of Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5. Sure, some duels in the first three series feature real monsters and physical damage, but they usually happen during a shadow game, or when some other mystical mumbo-jumbo is involved. Which I feel quite safe in saying isn't the case here. Hi, slightly future Michael here. I'm actually watching, or re-watching, uh, 5D's Series 2 uh, while making this video. And I just wanted to correct myself immediately. <laughs> in in that series, they do have uh, monsters that can cause physical damage, uh, but that only happens when they're up against the main bad guys of that season. While it's not stated here, it's later stated in the series that those bad guys and this guy here are actually related in some way. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. There is a legit reason why these monsters are able to cause physical damage. It's just not explained here. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just wanted to, just wanted to throw that out there. Oh, I know my way around a good chunk of the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe. I also get the feeling I might have alienated a lot of my subscribers who don't watch the show. Maybe this wasn't the best place to start. With a little help from his ace monster, elemental hero Neos, which I'm only going to refer to as Neos from this point onward, because good god I am not saying the full name every time, Jaden is able to survive a blast, before being confronted by a mysterious duelist. Jaden Yuki. The duelist who they say can speak with the spirits. Oh my god, is that Sean Shemmel? It is! How about that? Goku's the bad guy. Again. It's actually not that weird hearing Sean here, as he's played a variety of characters over the course of Yu-Gi-Oh's run. Most notably, being the voice of Dr. Crowler from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. It's actually even funnier when you remember that, in the original Japanese dub, 
Crowler is actually meant to be Italian, or at least of Italian descent. I like to think that before Italy became a little bit hotter, Jaden was considering meeting up and surprising his former teacher. That's just me, though. That's not, that's not, that's not confirmed. That's headcanon. It's my headcanon. The mystery duelist claims he's done what he needed to do, and summons a new monster to finish Jaden off. That being Stardust Dragon, Yusei's ace monster, and a card that shouldn't exist yet. Speaking of Mr. Fudo... Meanwhile, in the future... Good old Yus awakes from a nightmare, where he relives the terrible events that divided New Domino City in two. That being the Zero Reverse Project, a generator that was supposed to supply the city with new clean energy. But instead blew up, killing thousands, including Yusei's parents, who were working on the project. Even though he's already saved the city from the King of the Neverworld, see 5D Series 1, he still feels bad for what happened, since his family was involved in the Cataclysm. His friends and fellow signers, Jack Atlas and Crow Hogan, try to cheer him up by inviting him to a high-speed drive around the city. Maybe one day I will be able to forget about all the pain my father's research caused New Domino, but that day isn't today. I have an image to uphold. That being the cool, emotionless, brooding hero that I am. I'm like the Batman of card games. As they're driving about, they're met by the same mysterious duelist who challenges Yusei to a card game. As he accepts, we're thrown into our title card, then dropped into the middle of the match, where Yusei already has several monsters on the field, while his opponent doesn't. We can affirm this simply from dialogue, as Crow comments on how good this guy is. Though I can't help but wonder if he really is, since Yusei seems to have destroyed all this guy's monsters, leaving him wide open for a direct attack. Honestly makes me wish this film was a little longer so we could have had this duel play out. Also makes me wonder if he's using the same deck he eventually uses later in the film, though I'm assuming he doesn't. I'm actually surprised, again, considering he works with the bad guys from uh, uh, Series 2, that he doesn't have, like, a Mechlord deck. Although I suppose that would have made it tie in too much to the main series, and that's not what you really want from a special, question mark? In any case, Yusei is able to summon out his ace monster, Stardust Dragon. However, the Masked Duelist reveals a blank card and is somehow able to steal Stardust Dragon from Yusei's card. I'm assuming that what he's actually doing is stealing the Stardust Dragon Duel Spirit to make his own copy or something, but it's never point-blankly stated what happens, simply that Stardust Dragon has been stolen. The duelist disappears into nothingness as the three return to Yusei's workshop. As they ponder on what just happened, the rest of Team 5Ds turns up. The twins Leo and Luna, and Yusei's kind of sort of not really but should be girlfriend, Akiza Rizinski. Whoa, Akiza, you look... slightly different. Hmm? Oh, yeah, for some reason four kids didn't censor my cleavage or stockings for the movie, so, you know. Well, they're, um... I like me. Very nice. Hmm, but why would they censor something that half the population of the planet has? It's not like people would watch our show for stuff like that anyway. Well, clearly you've never summoned the Dark Magician Girl. The kids show Yusei an old news article about Yugi winning a tournament. At the time, it seems a little bit odd, but it does kind of come back. As well as, more importantly, the attack on Venice, along with a picture of Stardust Dragon. But I don't remember ever hearing about this. And this is a major historical event. That's just it. This is new history. Wait a minute. How do you guys know that? What time travel rules are we following here? At a guess, I want to say they're following a Back to the Future 2 style of time travel. Just as a refresher for one of my favourite movies of all time. Hehe. <laughs> here. Old Man Biff takes a sports almanac from 2015 and gives it to his 1955 self. While this causes a divergence in the timeline, creating a dystopian 1985 we see in the rest of the movie, Old Biff's 2015 is temporarily still in existence, since we see him return before being erased in a deleted scene as the new timeline starts to set in. Which is actually kind of ironic when you think about it. They deleted the depiction of a deleted timeline. 
It's, I think it's, I think, I, th I, th I think it's funny. Theoretically, a similar sort of thing might be happening here. While the destruction of Venice has happened in the past, the ripples of that effect, as well as what will happen later in the movie, haven't quite caught up with 5D's present time zone, hence why they're still in existence, and why they might be aware of some of the changes to the past. You could also say that the magical MacGuffin of them all being signers means that the Crimson Dragon is protecting them or something. Either, either works, really. Although, if that is true, then the question then becomes why does Leo remember the old timeline, since he isn't a signer... yet. Unless you're watching the English dub, in which case he never becomes a signer. Yeah, I really am rambling at this point. Good God. <laughs> oh, I really like time travel as well. Like I ever kept that a secret. By zooming into the picture, they recognise the mass duelist, just as the changes to time seem to catch up, with New Domino dissolving around them. The Crimson Dragon finally gets its claws out of its butt. If dragons even have butts. I know that one does. And draws Yusei towards his duel runner. Through its crimsony dragonness, it's able to transport Yusei back in time, just as Jaden is about to be obliterated. The master duelist escapes again, leaving the pair to become better acquainted. Jaden explains that a couple of his friends told him that a mysterious duelist had stolen their cards, the previously mentioned Cyber End Dragon and Rainbow Dragon. I went looking for the thief and found you know who. Actually, I don't know. That's kind of the point of the mask. Nah, bro, I mean, you know the dude I'm talking about. You get me, dog? I don't have your dog. And by the way, that's a cat. Jaden agrees to help Yusei stop the duelist, but doesn't quite believe that he's jumped back in time to change history even more. That is, until he checks some historical articles that prove he has. Why is this guy doing all of this? I don't know, but he's doing it as we speak. I mean, if he's in the past like you said, Yusei, then he's really not. He's, he's already done it, if anything. You're not thinking fourth dimensionally. Jaden's Neos disappears, and nothing of value is lost. As Vice. <laughs> Jaden's Neos disappears, as Venice starts to crumble like New Domino. Meanwhile, in the past, we find ourselves at that duel tournament the kids told Yusei about, with Yugi finally getting some screen time. In any case, Pegasus shows up, as well as the masked duelist who begins attacking the place. As the crowd scatters, Yugi is separated from his grandpa. It's my worst fear! I've been upstaged! Pegasus, people are dying right now. And now so are you. Say hi to Cecilia for me. Yugi's protagonist powers save him from being too badly hurt, though Grandpa isn't as fortunate. The mysterious duelist is very happy with himself. It took some doing, but history is now forever changed. Changed so that duel monsters is no more. Yeah, put a pin in that. We're going to come back to this. Yugi is picked up by the Crimson Dragon, who then deposits our three heroes about 30 minutes before the attack. Look, Neos is back. How? And why did he disappear in the first place? And please, nobody try and explain this. I really don't care. My name's Yusei Fudo. I'm the best protagonist, but Duel Monsters fans won't admit it. And I'm Jaden Yuki, and I want to die! I'm Yugi Moto, and I wore bondage gear to school, <laughs> but don't ask me why. The two get Yugi up to speed with what they've been able to deduce so far, as he decides to join up with them. Their first order of business is clearing away the civilians, which Jaden does by having Yubel blast the stage. The master duelist arrives, revealing himself to be... someone none of them know. What was the point of the mask again? The duelist, whose name is apparently Paradox... <laughs> that's the most edge lordy time traveller name that's ever existed. I agree to disagree. Easy, Paradox. 
reveals that he is from even further in the future than you say, and has come back in time to rid the world of the most dangerous thing ever created. Duel Monsters. Wait, what? True, you've all saved the world many times over with your precious cards, but against adversaries who are using the same cards to destroy it. Paradox, remind me what you used to destroy Venice and kill Pegasus. Where I come from is a doomed future. Oh, so he's from the Zexel timeline. No, our future is a bright one. Hate to break it to you, you say, but the future of the Yu-Gi-Oh timeline is anything but bright. Especially when you bear in mind what happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5. Good lordy. In all seriousness though, Paradox comes from the same bad future that's eventually revealed in 5D Series 2, so there is some legit in-universe reasoning behind his thought process here. While his compatriots try a slightly different method, see 5D Series 2, Paradox would rather stop this disease at the source by killing Pegasus and thereby changing the entire course of Yu-Gi-Oh! history. Which, yeah, as dumb as the idea of a card game destroying the world sounds, in Yu-Gi-Oh! it is a big thing. While the Doom Monsters game has a pretty humble beginning, with simple tournaments and even a theme park being made about it, by the time of GX, the game is so popular that there are numerous schools built solely to teach people how to play it, much like art schools in our world. Hell, the reason New Domino City is crumbling in the 5D's time zone is because the city is fundamentally rebuilt because of the game. Remove the card game from existence, and entire cities fade from existence, likely whole families as well. These are some legitimately big stakes. However, there is a problem with this. And that's the timing. Or more so, the time frame that Paradox has chosen. See, it's a little unclear as to when in Yugi's timeline this actually takes place. We can't really go from Yugi's physical appearance, since that's more up to the artist's interpretation of his character design. What we do have, however, is the clear presence of the classic Kaiba Corp dual disc, first introduced early in Series 2. Considering they only went on sale just before the Battle City Tournament, and that arc lasted all the way through to the end of Series 3, the general consensus seems to place these events happening some time after that tournament, but before the events of Series 4. Therein lies the problem. Paradox hasn't gone back far enough. At this point, Duel Monsters is popular enough to have an entire city pretty much closed down just so a child billionaire can host his tournament. Just because Pegasus has died doesn't mean his card game is going to dry up overnight. Hell, 5Ds is 50 years in the future, where Pegasus is most definitely dead. And they haven't stopped playing the game. I mean, good grief, do you really think Seto frickin' Kaiba is going to just allow Duel Monsters to stop being played because Pegasus is dead? It's been my headcanon for the longest time that, eventually, Kaiba buys the rights to Duel Monsters, considering just how much he contributes to making the game more accessible and fun. I'm pretty sure it's even implied somewhere that he even invented the first Duel Runner or something. Maybe even the first Synchro Monster. There's actually a really great video that was relatively recently released, and I'm going to link it up in the card thing. Do check it out. He, he, like, he's great. Awesome, awesome videos. If Paradox really wanted to stop Duel Monsters from existing, and I know this is kind of a cliche, but he should have gone back and killed Pegasus when he was a baby. Or on a less baby-murdering route, stop Pegasus from becoming a painter-slash-archaeologist, averting the card game's creation entirely. You could even go back even further and just destroy the Egyptian tombs that house all the original hieroglyphs that inspire Pegasus in the first place. You have access to time travel! There are so many options open to you, my guy! I agree to disagree. Easy, Paradox. Anyway, after Paradox says he's looking forward to wiping out everyone who's been touched by the game, losing all sympathy in the process, our three heroes continue to stand steadfast in his way.
Well then, it seems we have a difference of opinion. And since I doubt any more words will settle our impasse, perhaps we should seek to settle it another way. Oh, you know what this means? Yahtzee! Is charades off the table? Paradox's duel runner converts into hover mode as they prepare to duel. You know, that, that thing that Paradox wants to destroy. Our heroes pose for the trailer, showcasing their signature gimmicks. I have to say, it's really cool seeing Yugi's transformation into Yami here. That's just... Ooh, that's some, that's, that's some prime nostalgia right there. I have just one thing to say to you, Paradox. It's time to duel! Let's go! Is this what it's like to watch Lord of the Rings? Because I'm pretty sure we just saw... The Return of the King. <coughs> I'll go first. For the benefit of anyone new watching this who hasn't seen or played the game before, here's a very quick overview. Each player has a set number of life points, 8,000 in the real game, 4,000 in the anime. They then summon monsters to their field on their respective turns to try and reduce their opponent's life points to zero. You can also use spells and traps to try and give yourself an advantage. There are several videos you can find online that can teach you a hell of a lot better than I can. I'll even post a couple in the, uh, in the card thing up top. You can also get a handy dandy little rule book, which uh, uh, I found. But this is version 9.1, so I don't know how up to date this is. I mean, it doesn't have link monsters, so it's probably not as up to date as it should be. Tell you what, you can, you can, you can live there. Paradox starts by playing a field spell, Malefic World, that specifically allows him to add one random Malefic monster to his hand. In other words, this character and this deck are never going to appear again, so we've got to show how cool and threatening he is. Anime movie villain. Ooh. By discarding one monster, he summons the Malefic version of it. In this case, Cyber End Dragon becomes Malefic Cyber End Dragon. Wow, that's like crazy. Since this is a 5Ds movie, and because he was the current pro tag at the time, Yusei takes the first turn for the goodies. He uses a spell called Reincarnation of Hope to send two monsters to the graveyard, with the guarantee of drawing an additional monster later. Yusei is able to use his trusty Junk Synchron to return his two monsters from the graveyard, allowing him to Synchro Summon Junk Gardener. Synchro what? He's only confused because there aren't that many Synchro Magician monsters. Seriously, Konami, can we have some more Synchro Magician monsters, please? I mean, I really like Enlightenment Paladin, one of my favourite cards, but it only works properly in a Pendulum Magician deck, and I'd quite like to use one in my normal Magician deck, please. And thank you. It's Paradox's turn again, this time summoning Malefic Rainbow Dragon. As it attacks, Junk Gardener is able to switch it into defense mode, but Cyber End Dragon ends up destroying it anyway, costing them life points. Wait a minute, Junk Gardener was in defense position? And Malefic Cyber End Dragon doesn't have piercing damage? How did they lose life points? It's at this time that Paradox decides to reveal that if they lose the duel, then they'll lose their souls which just feels like a hokey rehash of the Shadow Realm. And yes, I know the Shadow Realm is a dub-exclusive thing, but it could have at least have been something like, if you lose the duel, you'll be erased from existence. You know, keep the whole, the whole time travel thing going, but... Whatever. Even though Junk Gardener was destroyed, its second ability forces Cyber End Dragon into defense mode, with Yusei then activating Miracle's Wake to bring Junk Gardener back. It's now Jaden's turn to take to the field, pulling off his usual GX bullshit of just so happening to have a polymerization in his opening hand. He fuses his Neos with Yusei's Junk Gardener to make elemental hero Neos Knight, getting an attack boost in the process. And thanks to its special ability, it's able to destroy both of Paradox's dragons. You know, while Jaden is maybe my least favourite of these three, and maybe coming in 4th or 5th if we include the other main characters, this is a pretty legit play and shows just how good of a duelist he is. Made about five times cooler with the rocking guitar playing the GX theme. You have to tell me, where did you learn to duel with such heart and passion? <laughs> a little place called Duel Academy. Huh, what an unoriginal name. I wonder what genius came up with that. Said Okaiba. No. Yeah, my guy. 
You can't be serious. Totes? Oh, I can't wait to tell Joey about this. Paradox starts his next turn by summoning Malefic Stardust Dragon, much to Yusei's dismay, along with a tuna monster, allowing him to synchro summon Malefic Paradox Dragon, which actually allows him to bring Stardust Dragon back to the field, decreasing Neos Knight's attack. As Paradox Dragon charges into battle, Jaden is able to, quite nicely, counter all attacks and card effects that try to get rid of him, as we now get to Yugi's turn. Then it's my move now, so get ready! Awesome. Banking in Reincarnation of Hope's effect, Yami Yugi adds his ace monster to his hand, the Dark Magician, summoning it to the field with Ancient Rule, and then uses bonds between teacher and student to bring out the ever-lovely Dark Magician Girl. Just went from a 9 to a 10. Oh my, it looks like it's going to be a real trick for us to come out on top here. Since when could they talk? Have you always been able to talk? I didn't have anything to say. Next, he plays Magic Gate of Miracles, allowing him to take one monster from Paradox's field and adding it to his side. In a super sneaky move, he makes it look like he's going after Malefic Paradox Dragon, forcing Paradox to activate a trap, while he was actually going after Stardust Dragon, returning it to Yusei's possession, which also restores their monster's attack points. Finally, Yami Yugi plays Dark Magic Twin Burst, adding Dark Magician Girl's attack points to Dark Magician, allowing him to destroy Paradox Dragon and finally dealing some damage. In all seriousness, this is some premium boss mode Yu-Gi-Oh right here. The Dark Magician and Dark Magician Girl look great in 5D's higher quality animation and style. And as a Dark Magician player myself, I really appreciate that Bond Between Teacher and Student and Dark Magic Twin Burst were turned into real cards. The only thing to make it sweeter would be if we had some goddamn Synchro Magicians Konami! However, with his dragon destroyed, this allows Paradox to activate a trap, sacrificing half of his life points in order to summon his most powerful monster, Malefic Truth Dragon, even allowing him to merge with it. Somehow. Look, I don't know how he does it, and I don't care how. This is stupid bonkers cool, and I love it. Meanwhile, over there... Mr. Pegasus, sir, you might want to hold on. Like a storm ahead. Wait a minute, does Pegasus have the Millennium Eye? Oh my god, he does! But if this is meant to be after Series 3 of Duel Monsters, then he shouldn't have it. When is this set? Back at the duel, Paradox summons malefic versions of Blue Eyes White Dragon and the Red Eyes Black Dragon. Because of Malefic Truth Dragon's effect, if any of our hero's monsters are destroyed, they're all destroyed. That prick paradox tries to set red eyes on Dark Magician Girl, but Jaden is able to use a defusion spell card to separate Neos Knight back into normal Neos and Junk Gardener, which Yusei uses to halt Red Eyes' attack. Blue Eyes attacks and destroys Dark Magician, triggering Truth Dragon's ability, which takes the form of tiny spikes. But once again, Yusei comes to the rescue, using Stardust's ability, negating their monster's destruction, and instead destroying Truth Dragon. However, Paradox banishes one of the monsters in his graveyard, allowing Truth Dragon to attack properly, destroying Neos along with all the other monsters, taking 800 points of damage for each, leaving our heroes on 500 life points. <laughs> Boo! Not cool! To rub more salt in the wound, Paradox is able to resurrect Malefic Stardust Dragon, though just to avoid confusion, Yusei still has the original Stardust in his possession, and unleashes his final attack. Yusei believes that all hope is lost, and that he's let New Domino down. Yugi and Jaden, on the other hand, seem pretty chill. Because, in a very roundabout way without actually saying it, Paradox doesn't believe in the heart of the cards while Yugi, Jaden, and Yusei do. They're also lucky that Malefic Stardust Dragon's blast is taking a real long time to get to them. However, Jaden, who's honestly the MVP of this duel, has a special little card that allows Yugi to summon his hairy ball, Karibo. Cree -cree. No, 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 not you, bearded Karibo. Cree. What the fuck? 
Karibo takes the hit, allowing our heroes to survive one more turn. Malefic Stardust is destroyed by an effect, as the real Stardust returns at the end of Paradox's turn. You say, huh? It's up to you now. It's your move. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh my god, even his shadow! Look at his shadow! Oh. With Yusei up to bat, Yugi reassures him that he isn't alone in this, as the thought of his friends give him the confidence he needs to take a stand. Hey, Yusei. Yeah? If you beat him, I'll totally let you touch him before Four Kids senses them again. The power of boners compels me! By using a trap card, Yusei is able to bring back all the monsters that were destroyed during the previous turn, with Jaden and Yugi both using their own traps to boost Stardust Dragon's attack to 10,000. By their powers combined, they not only obliterate Truth Dragon, but the last of Paradox's life points as well. And possibly even Paradox himself, considering we don't see him for the rest of the movie. I think they legitimately killed him. On the screen. Or banished his soul, or whatever, who cares. I mean, apparently he's a robot, so he doesn't even have a soul. Unless he dreams of electric sheep, of course, in which case maybe he does. I agree to disagree. Easy, Paradox. With Pegasus alive, the tournament goes as planned, as our three heroes of time watch on from up high. Hey, think we'll all meet again sometime? Hopefully, but again, considering how Arc 5 left the timeline at the end of its series, God only knows how that's going to work. The three put their hands together, symbolising their friendship across the eons. Or in other words, their bonds beyond time? Eh? Eh? Is, is, is the name of the movie. <laughs> Before you go, gentlemen, a question. Shoot, bro! You brought me back in time 30 minutes before the dragons attacked, correct? Yeah, so? So, is there now two of me? Oh god damn it. Nobody tell Taya! After dropping Jaden off, as well as presumably returning the stolen cards back to their rightful places in time, Yusei returns to New Domino City, safe once again. While Paradox claimed the future was bleak, Yusei knows that the future isn't set in stone. And with the help of his friends, they can make it a good one. Because the true magic of Duel Monsters isn't just in the cards, it's in all the friendships I've forged thanks to the game. What a legitimately wonderful sentiment to end a fun, entertaining, only slightly flawed anniversary special. Look, this special didn't have to showcase the most epic duel in the history of the series. All it had to do was unite the first three protags, throw in some references, pull off some good moves, and it would have done its job. And it did. Paradox isn't the most compelling of villains, and for me personally, while he has a large role to play here, isn't exactly iconic, par maybe his look? Actually, one thing I'll give them credit for, while I don't usually like it when villains are straight up killed, especially if they haven't reached their true potential, I'm glad they didn't reform Paradox, or change his mind like they have done for many of Yu-Gi-Oh's other villains. It's an absolute joy to see Yugi and the Pharaoh in live, ac in live action. It would be great to see them in live action. Don't know how they'd do it. It's just a joy to see Yugi and the Pharaoh in action again, especially in beautiful widescreen. And while I'm not the biggest Jaden fan, it's nice to see him again and arguably carry most of the duel. Neither of them has a particular character arc, but they also don't need one. Their stories are complete, or in Yugi's case, if this really is said after series 3, then halfway through. They're here for nostalgia bait, as well as to show just how far the anime, and to a larger extent, where the card game has come over these last 10 years on air. They played their parts in the story perfectly. Again, with Yusei being the current protagonist, this was always his movie. He has to come to terms with letting go of the past and creating the better future he desires. While he definitely has his moments, he is a little overshadowed by his predecessors here, in my opinion. 
Without his starter's dragon, Yusei seems to be at a loss when dueling, relying on Jaden to deal the initial damage to Paradox, as well as protect their life points, while Yugi is the one who's able to return Stardust Dragon to its rightful owner. This special is just under an hour long, only about 45 minutes if you don't count the summary of the first three shows and the credits, so there isn't exactly oodles of time to properly explore the possibilities of time travel and covering the three eras. Honestly, if this had had a similar runtime to the Dark Side of Dimensions movie, and a budget to match, then we really could have explored things in more detail as well as have more fun with it. I am working on a very basic outline on what I would do with something like this, but I won't bore you with the details here. If people are interested, I'm more than happy to make a separate video about it, so do let me know if you're interested. I don't know if this is contested, but this is the closest to a 5Ds movie we currently have, and it's honestly great when you consider just how much of it actually ties into its overarching story. So much so, and I can already feel people leaving angry comments regarding what I'm about to say reverberating back in time, but I've actually adopted this as a makeshift final to the 5D's English dub. Let me be clear, I am more than aware that a good third of 5D's second series was gutted by four kids for whatever reason and will likely never be dubbed. That being said, if you were to pluck these film's events and place them at the end of the English dub timeline, then it makes for a more than satisfying conclusion, especially when you compare it to the one we got. Instead of a rushed final, we have a lovely jaunt through the entire history of the franchise up to that point, ending with the more heartfelt notion that we're all connected through our shared love of this game. There's nothing on the dub side that could even contest this slight rearranging, since Leo never became a signer in the dub, and he still isn't one here. Even Yusei's character arc makes sense in this setting, though that in itself is really only contained to this special anyway, but it does feel a little more... poignant? Is that the right word? Look, I am not suggesting that everyone should do this, each to their own and all that, but if you are unable to finish 5Ds through the subtitle version, for whatever reason, I think this is a more than satisfying ending compared to the one we got. And let's face it, with the amount of changes made between the Japanese dub and the English dub, they're practically two different continuities. But... You know, that won't be enough for some people. Regardless of that, Bonds Beyond Time is great. A perfectly good anniversary special for duelists young and old that not only reunites them with their childhood heroes, but also, hopefully, reminds them why they picked up a deck in the first place. And I don't have a segue. The end. Thank you all so much for checking out this video. I really, really do appreciate it. I would have liked this to have come out a lot sooner than it did, but technology hates me. If you like what you saw, then I do actually have two live-action duels uh, that I've recorded with some friends back before this whole this whole pandemic thing happened, and as soon as we can meet in person again, we'd like to do more. Or you can check out some of my other stuff, like the Higurashi Retrospective, where I go a little too in-depth into one of my favourite anime of all time. Uh, I've also got uh, top ten lists for my favourite sci-fi of all time, uh, Doctor Who and its respected spin-offs. Just do what you want, have fun, share with your friends, or don't. I'm not your boss, or am I? As always, I've been Michael Crew from Crew on the Sofa, but you already knew that. If you beat him, I'll totally let you censor them. <laughs>